Game of Thrones Season 7 Episode 6 begins with our fellowship of heroes beyond the wall. There's a bit of a culture clash between Jon and Gendry and Tormund. Gendry is from the south, while Jon is from the north, and Tormund as a wildling is from the lands beyond the wall, north of the north. To him, Jon's north is the south, it's relative. So maybe the White Walkers, who come from the far north lands of Always Winter, would consider even the Wildling lands as south. Gendry is mad at Beric and Thoros, because in Season 3 they sold Gendry to Melisandre, who used him in a blood magic ritual. Gendry describes Mel having sex with him, and the Hound tells him to stop whinging. Gendry's experience with Mel was what you might call a rape. Gendry was Mel's prisoner, and she pressured him into sex that he had no option to refuse. But the story brushes this off as no big deal, and so did most of the viewers. Compare that to The Rape of Sansa by Ramsay Bolton, which was similar in that Ramsay had power over Sansa and pressured her into sex without her consent. There is a difference in the trauma Sansa felt here compared to Gendry's more relaxed response. But the fact that the Sansa scene caused such widespread media outrage while Gendry's scene was mostly ignored might say something about how our society views gender and sex. Jon and Jorah talk about Jorah's father, Jor, who was killed by Night's Watch mutineers in Season 3. Jorah says it's a horrible way for Jor to die, and Jon agrees, which is kind of funny because he died the same way, betrayed by his brothers at the Watch. Jor gave the Mormont family sword, Longclaw, to Jon in season one, because Jorah had shamed the family by slaving. Jon now tries to give the sword to Jorah, but he refuses, and says Jon should keep it. It's a nice gesture, but there are other Mormonts who might want to keep their family's most valuable possession. Jorah's cousin Lyanna could do some work with Valyrian steel, but Jon is the hero, and must have his magic sword. Down at Winterfell, Arya accuses Sansa of helping the Lannisters kill their father Ned, which isn't true. Sansa repeatedly pleaded for Ned's life, to the Queen, to the court, and at Ned's execution, which Arya saw. There is this letter supporting the Lannisters that Sansa wrote, but Cersei made her write that. Sansa was a child and had no choice, and Sansa tells Arya this. But Arya just attacks Sansa for being weak and stupid, and goes on again about Sansa's pretty dresses. So Arya has no real argument here, she's just acting out of anger over her childhood frustrations with pretty Sansa. Her anger's understandable, but it's a huge lack of perspective to be threatening Sansa for liaising with Lannisters years ago, when there are actual Lannisters out there right now who want to kill the Starks. Cersei is the real enemy. Has Arya forgotten her plan to kill the Queen? Her criticism of Sansa is also totally hypocritical, given that Arya served Tywin Lannister in Season 2, so Arya's acting really irrationally in this scene, which perfectly plays in to Peter's plan. He planted Sansa's letter to turn Arya against her, and now Sansa is coming to Littlefinger for help, just as he planned. He subtly suggests that Sansa, not Jon, should rule the North, which seems to be Peter's overall goal. He wants Sansa to rule the kingdom, and he wants to rule Sansa. But first, he has to deal with Arya. Littlefinger suggests that Sansa use Brienne to deal with Arya somehow, but it's not clear exactly what he's suggesting. Does he think Brienne would imprison or kill Arya? Because that doesn't seem likely. Or maybe he wants to send Brienne away so that she can't protect Arya. Whatever he's getting at, Sansa does end up sending Brienne south to represent her at the meeting with Cersei. It makes sense that Sansa needs someone she trusts at the meeting. But as Brienne points out, it's very risky for Sansa to send away her most loyal protector at this dangerous time. Especially considering in the very next scene, Arya confronts Sansa again. And this time, Arya has an actual argument. She suggests that Sansa wants to undermine Jon and rule the North herself. This is what Littlefinger was hinting at, and Sansa might actually kind of want it. She has disagreed with some of Jon's decisions. She is proud of her role in the Battle of the Bastards. And she does seem to believe Peter saying that she's a good ruler. So while Sansa would probably never actually betray Jon, part of her deep down might want to and Arya, with her Lion Game training, might see this. So it almost makes sense for Arya to pressure Sansa to deter her from betraying Jon. 
but pointing a knife at her sister and threatening to kill her and wear her face is pretty extreme. Aya's motivation is again far more personal than strategic. Cassandra asks about Aya's collection of faces, which Aya uses to take on magic disguises. Aya says that the faces make her feel empowered to take on whatever identity she wants without being forced into gender roles, which is not how the faceless men are meant to work. They are a cult who make you give up your identity and become no one to serve the god of death. But Aya is using their powerful magic for her own personal gratification. She's got great power, but no responsibility. So instead of using her magic wisely, she uses it to threaten her sister for being mean to her years ago. On the one hand, this kind of fits the theme of Aya rejecting the rules of the faceless men and choosing instead to wreak revenge on whoever she doesn't like at the time. But this also goes against Aya's theme of returning to her stark identity and family, which is one of the deepest parts of her arc. So this whole conflict between Aya and Sansa feels really contrived. But it may end soon. Bran hinted earlier that he knows things about Peter's schemes. If he reveals Littlefinger's betrayals, the Stark girls could bond again over bringing justice to their true enemy. Back beyond the wall, Tormund talks shit with the Hound and mentions Brienne. Brienne almost killed the Hound back in Season 4, but Tormund has fallen in love with her. A relationship between a wildling and a highborn southern lady could potentially be a big deal. In the books, Alice Karstark marries a wildling leader, which helps solidify the peace between wildlings and the north. Maybe Tormund and Brienne could do something similar. Beric speaks with Jon, and says he doesn't look much like his father, so he must look more like his mother. What Beric is saying is that Jon doesn't look like Ned, but we know that Jon's real father is actually Rhaegar Targaryen, and it's true that Jon doesn't look like him, with his blonde hair and purple eyes. Jon looks more like his mother Lyanna. There have been so many hints this season about Jon's real parents, we'll surely get more on this mystery sometime soon. The Hound sees a mountain that fits the vision he saw in episode 1, a mountain that looks like an arrowhead. This same mountain was also visible in Bran's vision of the creation of the White Walkers, which means that all this is taking place near the same spot where the Night King was born. There's also symbolism in the Hound looking at a mountain, because his hated brother Gregor is called the Mountain. Some still hope that the two might fight. At Dragonstone, Danny talks to Tyrion about heroes. She names Drogo, Jorah, and Dario, who are all brave men, but are they really heroes? Drogo was a brutal warlord who attacked innocent villages to kill, enslave, and rape their people. Jorah was a slaver who fled justice and spied on Daenerys. Dario is a mercenary who betrayed his own comrades and advises Danny to mass murder. By most standards, these guys are no heroes, but that's the thing about Game of Thrones. Some of the good guys are badder than the actual bad guys of other shows. Danny does name one true hero, though, Jon Snow, who almost always fights for what's right. Heroes like him, Danny says, get themselves killed, which in Jon's case is truer than Danny knows. They talk about Cersei, who Tyrion expects will set a trap for Daenerys when they meet at King's Landing. So Tyrion says they'll protect Danny by threatening to burn the city, if Cersei tries anything. But they do want to avoid deceit and murder. It's interesting that in previous times when Danny met enemies, she happily used deceit and murder. She betrayed and slayed slavers and slaves alike at Astapor. But if Danny wants her rule of Westeros to last longer than her rule of Marine, she needs people to trust her. Tyrion raises the question of succession, who will rule after Danny dies. Normally, it'd be the ruler's child, but Danny has no children, and apparently never will. Because in Book 1, Miriam Asdur tells Danny that she's infertile, and Danny never got pregnant by Dario, so it seems probably true. So, what happens to the realm after Danny dies? Danny doesn't want to talk about it. She gets prickly when Tyrion talks about her death, a bit like a certain author we all love. But Danny has got to work out something. So Tyrion mentions democracy as a possible way for Westeros to choose their next ruler, just as the Ironborn and the Night's Watch vote for their leaders. This is the first real glimpse we've gotten of what breaking the wheel might actually mean to Daenerys. And it seems she's serious about changing the politics and society of Westeros. Beyond the Wall, Jon's men are attacked by a zombie bear, which kills some redshirts and savages Thoros. 
Beric sets the bear alight, which doesn't kill it for some reason. Normally, fire kills zombies good. And the fire makes the hound too afraid to attack the bear, because the hound is scared of fire because of his burn. But finally, Jorah kills the bear with a dragonglass dagger. In the books, dragonglass doesn't seem to hurt zombies. It only kills the White Walkers. But in the show, dragonglass kills both, so the bear goes down. Thoros seems pretty relaxed about the hole in his chest. He takes a swig of drink and keeps on walking, leaving those poor nameless wildlings in the snow. In this show, there's nothing more deadly than having no dialogue. Thoros and Jorah talk about the Siege of Pike, a battle ten years ago when Thoros led a charge against the Ironborn, waving his flaming sword like some kind of god. But Thoros reveals that he wasn't really brave, he was just blackout drunk which is another of those moments in Thrones which questions the glory of war. Eventually the men see a small group of zombies led by a white walker. Maybe these guys are scouting or hunting for Benjen. Jon's men attack the dead, and when Jon kills the walker, most of the zombies fall except for one. Apparently zombies die when you kill the walker that raised them. This one zombie that survived must have been raised by a different walker. This is important information, because it means that the whole army of the dead could be destroyed if they can just kill the White Walkers, which Jon seems to be getting good at. Also, if we assume that the Night King created the other White Walkers through this baby-changing process, maybe killing just the Night King would kill all the other Walkers, as well as all the zombies. So this whole war could possibly end with just one swing of Jon's sword. The problem now, though, is that their captive zombie screams for help, and the entire army of the dead starts chasing Jon's men. Jon chooses this moment to get Gendry to send a message for help to Daenerys, which is really bad timing. Jon always knew that they were facing danger. Why not ask Danny for help before they're just about to be killed? Why not just have Danny come along in the first place and save them all this walking? But John runs to a convenient island on a convenient lake, which is just conveniently frozen enough for John to cross, but not frozen enough to let the dead. Gendry marathons to Eastwatch and sends a raven the thousand miles down to Dragonstone so that Danny can fly the thousand miles north to save them. Which would take days. Days of John's men freezing, eating, and sleeping on that island. And all the while, the Night King and the dead just stand and watch. Which is pretty weird. Even if they can't cross the water, they could just throw spears or shoot arrows or throw rocks at John, right? But the dead are patient. They waited about 8,000 years since the last long night, so maybe they might as well wait a few days for the ice to freeze. And the walkers do seem to enjoy toying with people. In book one, they stand in a circle and watch while a walker fights Waymar Royce, laughing and mocking him so watching John freeze and starve might be their idea of entertainment. Thoros dies of his wounds, and the men hold a little funeral for him. In book four, Thoros says, It does not matter how a man begins, but only how he ends. Thoros began this story as a fat, drunk failure of a priest, but he dies as a warrior, fighting for life against the dead. Check out the Thoros video for more on this character. The Hound, like an idiot, throws a rock that shows the lake is frozen, so the dead start to attack Jon's men. Jon uses Valyrian steel, Beric has his flaming sword, and Tormund and Jorah and Sandor use dragonglass weapons, so they've got exactly the right tools to counter the dead. But there are a lot of them though, so shit gets pretty real before the inevitable Drogon Ex Machina arrives. Danny swoops in with her dragons and burns the dead, a bit like that dream in Book 3. But as she rescues Jon's men, the Night King activates his trap card and throws an ice spear that hits Danny's dragon Viserion, killing one of the only three dragons alive in Westeros. The king has three spears for Danny's three dragons, almost as though he knew that they were coming. So some people theorize that this whole thing was a trap. But it's not clear how the Night King would know that Danny's dragons exist, let alone that Danny would come save Jon at this time and place. Danny didn't even know she would come until like a day ago, so unless the Night King is straight up psychic like Bran, the trap idea doesn't seem likely. After Viserion dies, Jon decides not to immediately get on Drogon and fly away, but instead to kill some more zombies and take a dip in the lake, so Danny leaves without him. 
If Danny had decided instead to attack the Night King, to burn him or crash a dragon into him, she could have ended this whole war there and then, but she flees and leaves her child Viserion dead in the lake. John survives, because at this point falling into water is practically a guarantee that a character will live. Then he faces the army of the dead and prepares to die, a bit like he did at the Battle of the Bastards. You'd think that after dying and being reborn, John would have learned to stop throwing himself into such impossibly dangerous situations, but it seems like he's now decided that he can take as many risks as he likes and he'll always survive. Because somehow he always does. Benjen saves him at the last minute and John gets away again. One of the moments that defined Game of Thrones Season 1 was the death of Ned Stark, which showed that when good guys make mistakes, they may die. In Season 3, Rob and Catelyn made mistakes, and they died. But by rescuing Jon from certain death over and over and over, by saving Jaime and saving Arya, it takes away the tension and drama. Every time this happens in this story, we care less. Jon's reunion with Benjen is one of the most long-awaited moments in the series. For years, five books and seven seasons, Jon has been hoping to see his uncle again. And in the books, there are hints that Benjen knows secrets about Jon's birth. He was involved in the Night of the Laughing Tree incident, which may have led to Jon's parents hooking up. Go watch that video. But in the show, there's no time for that detail. Benjen turns up, says hi, I'm a zombie, goodbye, and decides he'd rather die than share a horse with his nephew. It does feel a bit anticlimactic, but there is pathos implied in Benjen's death. Benjen has apparently been surviving in the North on his own as a zombie man for years and years. He's probably suffered in ways that we can't imagine, but he kept on fighting all this time until he got the chance to do something noble, saving John before letting go. He was ready to die, and ended it on his terms. So the reunion is a bit janky, but there is some meaning here. The Hound carries the captive zombie through the wall. The way this seems to work is that the magic of the wall stops the dead getting through uninvited, but the dead can pass through the wall if they're carried by the living, like with Othor and Jaffa Flowers in Season 1. That being the case, you'd think that Benjen could have crossed the wall if someone just carried him, but he's not an ordinary zombie, so maybe he works differently. Either way, the heroes have succeeded in their insane plot to catch a zombie. Hopefully, it'll be worth it. Danny stands on the wall and waits for John, or maybe she's hoping for a dragon. The dragon doesn't come, but John does, collapsed on his horse, just like he was in season three. Danny sees his chest and learns that he really was stabbed in the heart, and that he's been keeping up with his sit ups. When he wakes, John says he's sorry about the death of her dragon. Danny did say that her dragons are the only children she'll ever have. But some people speculate that the death of Viserion might allow Danny to have kids again. Because Danny's infertility seems to be a sort of a curse from Miri Mazdur, who once said that only death can pay for life. Maybe the death of a dragon will allow Danny to make life again. Danny and John having children might well be on the cards from all the talk of kids and succession this episode, and from the way John and Danny are looking at each other lately even though they are aunt and nephew. In fact, due to generations of royal inbreeding, this is like super incest between John and Danny. But regardless, John says he'll kneel to Danny and make her his queen, finally forming a great alliance to face the dead. Meanwhile, the dead pull Viserion out of the lake, like ants pulling a worm. Some people have questioned how the dead got these chains, but the walkers have been around for thousands of years. It's plausible enough that they found some chains from a ship or a merchant or that scythe at some point. So they pull out the dragon, and the Night King raises it as a zombie, a blue-eyes white dragon. Since the Night King turns the dragon by touching it, it seems possible that this dragon is now more like a white walker than just a regular zombie, like how the Night King changed that baby. That baby was alive, though, while Viserion is dead, so there's lots of uncertainty about what sort of powers the dead dragon will have. Will it breathe fire? Seems unlikely when fire kills zombies. Maybe it'll breathe frost, like an ice dragon, which is a whole other thing, a dragon that's made out of ice. Whatever the specifics, zombie dragons are really bad news. This is NK getting nukes, and they will use it. No one is safe, and Danny and John must bring fire and fury to stop the dead.
In this episode, Beric says that the enemy is death, and maybe we don't need to understand any more than that. It's like Beric is telling the audience that we don't need to understand how Jon survived on that island for days, or why the Night King stood and watched. We don't need to understand why Arya suddenly turned on her sister, or how Jon survives again and again, or how Cersei's reign works politically. And maybe we don't need to understand. But Game of Thrones, at its best, isn't just about battles and dragons. It's complex politics and human drama that makes you think. David and Dan do an amazing job of adapting a story that George Martin wrote to be unadaptable. And at this point, they've even run out of books to adapt. But hopefully, these last seasons of Thrones can conclude the story without losing that layer of detail and depth that makes Thrones unique. Thanks for watching. Thanks to patrons Jesse Deal, Charlie Fox, Hannah Hurst, Nicola Thompson, Bruno Zorzi, Shell Bell, and J-Pop Cheers.